James. Uh, I will have uh, James introduce Eric and uh, uh, and for whoever wants to talk about the conference, uh, if you if you use hash state of the art dot AI uh, or state of the art AI, uh, we will actually pick a raffle at the end of the uh, conference sessions and give out uh, five different uh, Apple AirPods. So um, yeah, let's get started on the next session. James, you want to take it away? Yep, absolutely. So just checking where. Are we moving over from the slides to our faces? I'll assume that will happen. Anyway, so yes, uh, as uh, Bindu said, uh, today I'm joined by Eric Brynjolfsson, who is an economics professor at Stanford and specifically um, a direct, uh, the director of the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. Now, Eric's research involves uh, investigating the impact of information technology and the, generally these sort of digital technologies on all aspects of the economy. And that includes the impact of machine learning on the economy. So I think that's where we, we're going to start. So Eric, you wrote a paper entitled, What Can Machine Learning Do? Now, I think uh, a good answer to that question is something that's probably of great interest uh, to, this, uh, to the attendees here. So it'd be great. Would you be able to give us an overview of that research? And then perhaps we can start deep diving into some of the specifics. Sure. Well, first off, uh, thanks so much for uh, welcoming me here. I'm really looking forward to uh, our conversation, James, and also looking forward to the questions and comments from the audience. I understand that uh, they'll have a chance to ask questions as well. Um, regarding what machine learning can do, uh, that's a paper that I wrote with uh, with Tom Mitchell, who used to uh, run machine learning at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and it addresses you know this big question about how machine learning is going to affect the economy. A big focus of my own research. Um, I think we all know that we're far from artificial general intelligence and machine learning can't just do everything that humans can do, but it has reached um, human level or even superhuman level performance on many, many tasks, a lot more just in the past 10 years and things like, uh, you know, image net and voice recognition and, and other areas um, that are affecting more and more potential occupations. What Tom Mitchell and I did was we uh, interviewed a lot of uh, machine learning experts and came up with a rubric uh, a set of questions that you can ask about any task, um, about 20, 25 questions you can ask about any task. And then we uh, applied those to um, working with Daniel Rock, who was then a PhD student and now is a professor at Wharton. Um, we applied those to a large number of tasks in the economy to see how suitable each of those tasks were for machine learning. Um, it turns out that there's a, a, a data set that lists or attempts to list all the tasks that people do in the economy. Uh, it's called ONET, and uh, the government has been tracking um, hundreds, about 950 occupations for, for 50 or 60 years. And for each occupation, it lists what tasks are required. They started doing this for uh, disability purposes and others. So for instance, uh, radiologists do 27 different tasks, economists do tasks, primary school teachers, bus drivers, everybody does a set of different tasks when they do their occupation. And for each of those tasks, there are about 19,000 of them, we scored them on based on this rubric by answering questions. And that gave us an image, uh, a snapshot of, of what, what share of the economy could be done uh, by machine learning at its current state of the art. No, no additional advances improve, needed. Um, and it turned out to be about a trillion dollars worth of the tasks in the economy could be readily done with machine learning just right now um, off the shelf. Um, far less than that is currently being done by machine learning, which, which reflects the need to uh, roll them out and implement them and make business process changes, which, which in practice takes a long time. I'm happy to dive into any deep part of that you'd like to discuss more, um, and I could describe the research in more detail if you'd like. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that stuck, stuck out to me there, um, yeah, pointing out, you know, so we're far from AGI, but we are superhuman in some areas. So I guess right. um, um, are there, yeah, in, in that research, did you find there were some tasks for which superhuman levels of AI are now actually applicable? Um, uh, yeah, so well, it's, it's an evolving frontier. As you know, for a long time, machines have been able to do a lot of routine information processing tasks. You know, obviously they can calculate numbers a lot uh, you know, multiply big numbers much faster than I can. And one of the reasons we, you know, we do payroll and other things by machines, it's because of that. But now if you look at the data on say ImageNet, 
10 years ago, uh, image recognition was at about 70% accuracy on ImageNet of 14 million different images that my, my now colleague Fei Fei Li put together. Um, now it's, uh, it's you know, over 95, 98%, depending on the, uh, the metrics. Um, and, and, you know, interestingly, that's better than what humans do. I have to admit, when I look at some of the pictures in ImageNet, I don't always know whether it's a gazelle or an antelope or, or what breed of dog it is, or even sometimes whether it's an apple or uh, uh, an orange or a lemon. I mean, some of these differences are a little subtle. Um, and not that ImageNet, uh, not that machines always get them accurate, but, but we have kind of crossed a threshold there. And as, a, uh, as an economist, when you look at, at you know, a number of tasks in the economy, and there's two ways of solving the task, two inputs that can solve that particular um, problem, um, entrepreneurs, managers are going to choose the one that solves it more accurately and at lower price. And it's like when you cross the boiling point of water, um, you, you, it's, a, it's a phase change as you shift from one way of doing the task to another way. Um, it can take a long time, uh, more than a few minutes, like it is with boiling water, but the economy makes that transition and, uh, you know, profit seeking entrepreneurs are going to switch to the way of doing it better. So um, there's still, I want to be very clear, there's still lots of tasks that humans have a comparative advantage in. And when I look around, I don't think that we're going to see the end of work anytime soon. I think that on the contrary, there's, there's so much work, whether it's in, in childcare or healthcare or cleaning the environment, or creative work, scientific discovery, entrepreneurship, even a lot of uh, fine manipulation. You know, uh, our hands are, are still more dexterous than, than most robotic hands. Um, in many of these tasks, humans continue to have a significant advantage. And I think in, in many of them, they will for, for, for a decade or more. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm pick, picking on, uh, you said they're more accurately. So I think that is, uh, that's also one of the potential barriers to something um, uh, to machine learning being applied accurately to, to it. Uh, machine learning is not perfect. Right. Uh, you're not going to get 100% accuracy with it. I mean, well, sometimes you will, but uh, you won't get ac accuracy. You won't get provability often. Um, was that sort of one of the significant barriers to certain tasks that you saw? It, it, it is. And there are some tasks, you know, where there's a life or death situation where you really do need, if not 100% accuracy, very, very high levels of accuracy. And so one of the criteria was, you know, just what the stakes are. And uh, I think it's also a psychology that I think most people feel less comfortable with machines making mistakes than they do with humans making mistakes. You know, whether that's fair or not, that, that's the reality. Um, I do think it's, it, it is a little unfair sometimes when, when I see, you know, on panels like this, people put up this, um, this goal or this expectation of complete perfection. And they say that, you know, until a self-driving car has zero deaths or until a hiring algorithm makes zero uh, mistakes, we shouldn't implement it. And I think that's not realistic. You have to look at basically what's the best alternative and can, can the machine learning system do better? Um, but certainly the, the fact that, that these systems often are not provably perfect does create a, a barrier and a hesitation to implementing them in some of those applications. Yeah, so interesting that you pick uh, the examples of hiring and self-driving cars there. So I think in, in hiring, that's possibly an area where some companies just with abandon have applied these new systems and then post hoc have discovered uh, potentially the, the various different versions of bad decisions that they're making. Whereas I think in self-driving self -driving cars, there's, there was a, I think many companies are going down the route of like they are aiming for perfection. I was wondering if you had any particular insights, say in the self-driving car industry about how that's going. It's like we have now had, you know, first death potentially cause. Well, I wanted to say, you know, <laughs> I, I like to be optimistic about the technology. And some people have called me a techno optimist. I, li I like to think I, I, I'm realistic, though, that we can have very good outcomes if we apply to, to it. But I have to also admit uh, and, you know, and, uh, and point out my own mistakes that I was over optimistic about self driving cars. In, in 2012, I rode down Route 101, just uh, out, you know, near, near where I'm sitting here now. Um, from Mountain View up to San Francisco in a Google self-driving car. That's almost, what, nine years ago. Um, I was blown away, you know, they, they, sitting there. And, and I wrote about it in my book with Andrew McAfee, The, the Second Machine Age. Um, I was, you know, had the impression, my, my host led me to believe, I think, that uh, soon we would be seeing these kinds of self-driving cars much more widely deployed. And while there has been significant progress and, and now we can you know, make left turns against traffic and other things that we couldn't at the time, um, overall, it, it's been something that's taken longer and been a little bit more difficult 
than I think a lot of people anticipated, certainly than I anticipated. At the same time, there's other areas. I mentioned machine vision, language, uh, you know, what GPT-3 is doing um, and a number of other more arcane areas in protein folding and elsewhere. Uh, NMA uh, mentioned this a little bit. Um, there, you know, the progress has been amazing. It's been staggering. And so that's been, that's been good to see as well. Yeah. Um, I, I can also comment a little bit on the, on the, on the hiring bias. I mean, I think this is something that, that is worth talking about a bit, you know, that, that um, one of the things that has become much more prevalent um, over the past few years is the fact that as machine learning starts being used in really important things, not just hiring, you know, bank loans, medical decisions, who gets parole and, and who stays in prison. Um, these are, these are really high stakes uh, decisions. And uh, what we've discovered is in many cases, the machine learning algorithms are, are horribly biased and uh, they're biased because they've learned from biased data. The truth is that all of us, me, everyone else um, has biases, often implicit biases, much as we try not to be biased. Um, and so if you train data on, on um, biased examples that, that certain races are more likely to be um, sentenced to prison by judges or certain types of people are more likely to be hired to get loans by the, the people who make those decisions. The machine learning algorithm is, is going to pick up on that and uh, perpetuate and amplify those biases. And, and that's you know, something I think most of us don't want to see. And it would be nice to build algorithms that, that have less bias. But as I said before, unfortunately, I don't think that the standard can be perfection. Um, in fact, you can prove that it's, it's mathematically impossible to have perfection because if you have you know, some level of false positives and you try to eliminate those, then you're going to have more false negatives. If you try to eliminate the false negatives, you're going to have more false positives. And you can't um, balance them across all groups and all situations while, when the data are, are, are different. What you can do, however, is dramatically reduce the bias. And I am optimistic in the sense that I believe these algorithms ultimately can and should and will be much less biased than the humans who make these decisions. And if we work very hard and we pay attention to these kinds of biases, we can build uh, tools where the biases are exposed and, uh, and reduced and continually minimized. And we can make conscious decisions as we will have to about what kinds of errors we're willing to tolerate or not tolerate and, and build those into the systems. My sense is difficult as it is to um, modify and update machine learning systems to reduce bias, it's even more difficult to, to change human hearts and minds and eliminate implicit bias. So, uh, so personally, I, I, would, I would rather have us uh, turn over more of the decisions to machine learning systems where we work to, to reduce those biases in a, in a careful, conscious way. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. Um, I guess uh, that's an interesting one, because like, um, do you think some of those ideas there, do those fit into the, you know, the, the, the rubric you were saying for like, what is it that machine learning can do? So I think you know, in the hiring situation, Mm -hmm. it, like initially, it seems like such a great application of machine learning because you know potentially it is you know if you're at this sort of early stage of hiring, it is just a you know, take take a CV, yes no, does it meet the first does it meet the first uh, pass, which is exactly one of those like learn a function type situations. I mean, I'm wondering here. So here, what you're pointing out is that if you just learn a function, it potentially doesn't do what you want it to do, as in it is repeating those old biases and potentially in a sort of uh, you know, unscrutable way, you can't look at, you can't understand what it's doing. Um, is that something that fits into the, the framework for what can machine learning do? Would yeah. you now potentially rule that out as saying like actually current tech not quite there for that process? It, it, it does fit it and, and, and the rubric is flexible enough that it, it, it's not just a, a zero or one, yes or no, there, there's a score. And so, so when I said that, for instance, I gave the, the, the trillion dollar value before that was only the applications that had at least scored 90%. They were really the, the top 10% of the applications where it worked very well. But um, you know, in general, hiring is actually a pretty good application. It, it may be that um, if it's done poorly, you end up having these biases, as I said. Um, one of my uh, former colleagues at MIT, Danielle Lee, has a nice paper where she compares supervised learning systems to reinforcement learning systems for hiring. And she shows that the, the supervised learning systems will tend to bake in historical biases much, much more and lead to not only worse candidates, but also more bias over time. Whereas the reinforcement learning systems can learn that there may be a group that you, um, you haven't hired a lot in the past. They'll do a kind of an explore, exploit trade-off 
and and try out some of those people who you never hired before. And uh, even though you have no little or no data on them, they, they, you know, the, the algorithm will intentionally try to hire some of them. And then if they turn out to be successful, then you've, you've made a discovery and you end up having better benefits for the company. And also, as I said, less, less bias. So there are ways of, of doing them in ways that, that you, can, you can do better on, on both dimensions simultaneously, which is nice to see. I also think that, you know, while these algorithms are often fairly opaque compared to say a traditional algorithm, um, they're still in many ways more transparent than, than human decision-making. Mm. Even people themselves, when they introspect, don't realize why they're making decisions. There are famous results from behavioral economics that the judges, sad to say, uh, are more likely to give harsh sentences when they're hungry before lunch than, than after they've had a nice meal. Or this is an even scarier one, uh, judges in, in one state, I won't say which one, uh, tend to give harsher sentences when their home team from their football, um, from their, from their, where they went, were alumni, uh, loses a game unexpectedly. Uh, the next day, they apparently a little grumpier than they are uh, otherwise. So those are some things that, uh, that obviously we don't want to see in our, our decision making. And, and I think can largely be eliminated um, from, from machine learning, even if other biases uh, are still something we need to be wary of. Yeah, well, having visited some college football towns in the past, I can totally, <laughs> totally believe that. Yeah, language. no, I can't. I get, I get kind of grumpy myself when my favorite team uh, loses, and I hope it doesn't show up in my grading. Uh, but you know, something to be careful of. Yeah, no, I totally agree with those points. There, like, I think it's um, so some early research I saw on the sort of subject of like, I think you know, it was that they've chosen loan applications as their area of research, and you know, this was back back when they were pointing, you know, the research then at the time was pointing out. You can't just, you know, you've got some covariates in your data that are things you don't want to make decisions on. And the research yeah. at the time had said, you can't just remove them because the algorithm will find a way to find proxies for them. That's exactly right. I mean, a good example, um, you know, my, my, one of my colleagues uh, did an did a experiment on humans where they sent out resumes with um, um, black sounding name, African-American sounding names like, like Latanya and white sounding names like, you know, Brian. And um, the, they found that the identical resumes got fewer callbacks with the black sounding name than the white sounding name. And it wasn't anything on the resume explicitly says, you know, I, what race they were, but people make these inferences. And, uh, and, the, and of course, algorithms can, uh, you know, machine learning can, can, can at times do the same thing uh, inadvertently. Yeah, no, I think there's a, definitely an opportunity here for making some of those trade-offs, some of those choices, some of those biases, just much more explicit, just pointing out, look, they're here. In some situations, you have a trade-off, which is, like you're saying like before, how much to explore versus how much to like, exploit your current knowledge. And exactly. Other, seeing, those, uh, seeing those biases, which is very important. So yeah, was, um, let's go a little bit further into, so um, yeah, we talked about maybe like different areas where it's very easy to apply machine learning, like you can do something right now, get, you know, get a boost to your business, other areas where there are a lot of different steps involved. Like, can you talk about maybe the spectrum or? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, let me give you a, a couple of examples. I mean, so, so at, at, at several different levels. First off, you know, there are just some tasks that are more suitable for machine learning than others. So everyone, you know, one of the favorite examples I hear hundreds of times, you've all heard is, is radiologists and uh, image recognition. And then I just mentioned how well, how much better image recognition has become. Well, we look specifically at, at radiologists. We looked at um, actually 900 different occupations, but radiologists was one of them. There, are, according to ONET, this data set we're working with, there are uh, 27 distinct tasks that a radiologist does. One of them, a particularly important one is reading medical images, but they also consult with other physicians on uh, treatment plans. Sometimes they do physical exams and so forth. Um, reading medical images is one that machines have gotten very, very good at, but I, I really wouldn't want it doing a, a physical exam or, or trying to have a, a conversation and consulting conversation with, with other radiologists, at least not currently. Um, and when you look at the, the set of tasks that radiologists do, um, you find that many of them are just not suitable for machine learning. Um, in fact, this was what we found in every single occupation, that there were some tasks that were suitable for machine learning, but others often, you know, 10 or 15 of the tasks where machine learning wasn't any use whatsoever. So my takeaway from that is that we're not likely to see the wholesale replacement of many, if any, occupations by machine learning. Um, but what we will see is um, major restructuring and reorganization where you delegate parts of the job to machines, 
other parts, humans. And it's going to take intelligent entrepreneurs and, and managers to, to reinvent work and reorganize it so that you take advantage of what machines can do well while still having humans do the other parts. It's much easier to build a system where humans are doing what they're good at, machines are doing what they're good at, rather than trying to build a, a soup to nut system that, that's fully automated. Now, there are a few tasks where it's worked out that machines can do most of it. I recently did a study of, of machine translation at, at eBay. And there, there was almost a, a plug and play. It was relatively straightforward where the machine translation system could, uh, could just pop in. And uh, the net result was that you almost immediately, in about three weeks, you saw an 11% increase in sales between the pairs of country. As an economist, I was, I was happy that they rolled it out in a phased mechanism for different language pairs, you know, <laughs> French and English, Spanish and English, uh, Portuguese. And each time they flicked it on, we could see the difference between those language, those countries versus other countries. So it made a, a nice natural experiment. And so we got a pretty clean measure. But that is the exception, not the rule. Um, most of the time you need to do much more careful thoughtful reorganization of work and invest a lot in uh, what we call digital capital or, or organizational capital to reinvent business processes. And that's, that, that can take uh, months, years, in some places, even decades. Yeah. So yeah, let's maybe talk about that. So as you point out, like there are a few areas where it can be plug and play, but perhaps maybe even the majority of areas, like it, it's not, it's, it's right. going to be investment. So you've done some, uh, you've basically, uh, you've conducted some research into the area, um, looking into the investment required, potentially explaining why, um, you know, from in all sorts of different areas, I've heard people talk about, you know, productivity stagnation, you know, where's, where's, mm -hmm. the, where's productivity growth gone with all the, you know, if machine learning can do so many things, where is it? Yeah. Um, well, these, these, this, the, the productivity, I was surprised to see it's actually been pretty disappointing the past decade. And it's related to what we we're just talking about, this need for restructuring. You know, let me just give you the data, the facts. Um, over the past uh, 15 years or so, productivity growth has only been 1.3%, which is historically pretty low, 1.3% growth per year. Um, for instance, in the 90s and early 2000s, it grew 2.8%, more than twice as fast. And to me, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm sitting around surrounded by these uh, technology wizards who are doing just breathtaking things. And I thought, well, why, how can it be that we aren't getting more productivity? And, uh, and so I've been looking closely at this, you know, what we call it the AI productivity paradox with, with Daniel Rock and, and with uh, Chad Severson. And um, we have identified, you know, not just the facts of this lower productivity, but also some hypotheses about what's going on. Um, let me lay out the two main stories for what's going on. The first one, which I hear a lot from my Silicon Valley friends, is that we're just not measuring the economy well. Um, we are creating all sorts of wealth that is not showing up in the GDP statistics. Um, our official GDP is um, based on all the things that are bought and sold in the economy. And so if something has zero price, like say Wikipedia or like most of the apps on my, my phone, um, yeah, they're, they're basically invisible. They have zero price and they have zero weight in GDP. In fact, I looked at the data for what's called the information sector in the GDP national accounts, which includes, you know, software, internet, it also includes movies, books, TV. Um, and that was uh, between four and 5% of GDP in the early 1980s. And since then, of course, we've had an explosion of just, I mean, we spend so much of my time, I spend a lot of my time online, like we are right now. Um, but uh, the current statistics are that it's still just under 5% of GDP. So it's almost as if, nothing happened. It's, it's, it's invisible. And again, this, this goes to this problem of, uh, of zero price, not counting in GDP. Now, I was saying, talking about productivity earlier, it's important to understand that the definition of productivity is just GDP divided by hours worked. So if you mismeasure the numerator, GDP, you're going to mismeasure productivity by the same amount. And so we are, we are just missing the boat on a lot of the, the benefits of the digital revolution of, of AI by extension. Um, so that's part of the story. I do believe that's part of the story. I don't think it's all of the story. I, I was a little bit more of a, a emphasizing this, but then my, uh, my colleagues, it's a good thing to have uh, to give these presentations is they, they push back on me a little bit. And the people like Bob Gordon and, and my, my co-author, Chad Severson, my now co-author, pointed out that yes, we are missing a ton of value today, but guess what? 
We also missed a lot of value in the, you know, the 50s and the 20s and, and before that. Uh, penicillin, you know, pretty impressive stuff. Television, uh, radio, there, there were some great inventions in the past that also were not fully captured. So now, now our job's a little harder. Are we mismeasuring more now or mismeasuring more then? And that's a, uh, that's a, that's a harder question. I, I, I do think we're mismeasuring more now. The digital economy has grown as a share of it, but mm -hmm. it's not a slam dunk case. No, and that leads me to the second big explanation of what's going on, which is goes back to what we were saying earlier about the need for business process change. Um, we looked historically at the introduction of really big, important technologies like the steam engine, electricity, you know, early computers for that matter. And in each case, it was remarkable that the productivity as measured did not increase significantly when it was first introduced, but only after 20 or 30 years. Like when the case of electricity, Paul David documented the introduction of electric motors into American factories in the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s. Um, and uh, the records show almost no productivity gain, which I was like, wow, that's a, the early productivity paradox. It, it took till the 1920s, 30 or 40 years later, to start seeing this soaring productivity. The difference was that when they first introduced the motors, they just simply pulled out the steam engine and put an electric motor in the same place and didn't change any of the machinery or the gears, which hardly made a difference to their performance. Later, a new generation of managers realized that instead of having one big motor in the middle, the way you'd have to with a steam engine, electric motors can be made whatever size you want. You can have them a little motor for one piece of equipment, a medium sized motor, a big motor, and you could lay out the equipment based on the flow of materials. When they started doing that, these large, you know, horizontal multi-acre factories where the uh, materials went based on, on like a production line, then you got not just an increase in productivity, but you got like these staggering doubling and tripling of productivity. But it took, as I said, a generation that and this same pattern, I won't go, go through all the details, you can read my paper. We saw it over and over in different cases. And I think that's a big part of what's happening today is that uh, you know, the internet, AI, each of these technologies, um, you really have to rethink businesses to get the full benefits. And that requires business process change, it requires new skills, it requires a lot of co-invention. In fact, probably about nine tenths of the investment, according to our data, it is about nine tenths of the investment, is in this intangible organizational capital. And only one tenth is directly in the technology and we're still making those investments in the, in the kind of invisible nine tenths of the investment. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, on that point, uh, are we are we expecting to wait a, a generation <laughs> time, or uh, should hope like you know just the, the nature yeah, of the, you know, the disruption is that? I'm, I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm maybe I'm a perennial optimist. I think it's going to happen a lot faster this time around. The last quarter, I don't want to go by one quarter of data, but the last quarter productivity was 5.4%. So, you know, what is that? Four or five times as fast as it was uh, previously. Um, you know, that's one quarter. I do think, you know, paradoxically, the pandemic has compressed some things. There, it was a tragedy in many, many ways. I don't want to at all minimize that. Mm -hmm. um, but one small silver lining is that it got a lot of us to work remotely and start using technology more. It made companies stop and rethink the way they organized work. And it does seem to be driving uh, significant productivity gains. Um, I suspect that we're in the early stages of a, of a productivity boom. I have a paper coming out on Friday called The Coming Productivity Boom, where I make this prediction more specifically. And so I think the next five years, we'll, we'll see that boost. Um, but it, it's, it's the second part of the pattern that you also saw with, uh, with electricity and everything. We call it the productivity J curve, where initially productivity goes down and then it, then it takes off uh, in a J uh, shape. Um, and the past you know, five or 10 years, we've been at the bottom part of that J curve. And now I think we're seeing the takeoff and it's being compressed a little bit um, because of the, the, you know, what happened in 2020. And uh, that, that, you know, that could make it go a lot faster. The other thing, you know, maybe this is, uh, is too self-congratulatory, but I, I think that, that there's been a lot of uh, people in business schools and consulting and, and conferences who are talking about how to use these technologies and compressing it. You go back to the 1920s you know, and 1900s, there wasn't this industry focused on how do we use technology more effectively a little bit, but not the same extent there is today. And, um, there's now as much emphasis on 
figuring out how to apply and re-engineer and redesign companies as there is just in inventing the technology. And that also hopefully will compress and speed the diffusion of these uh, new ways of working. Yeah, that's interesting you mentioned uh, potentially is compression of some of these things um, partially due to the pandemic. So I think um, that makes me interested. So as a, uh, as a fellow recent transplant to the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I think I, I think if, I, if I've read up on you correctly, part of your uh, reasoning for moving here was sort of the, you know, given your, the nature of your research, you wanted to be part of like a, a hub for um, sort of you know, innovation relating to machine learning, AI, just generally information technology. Um, moving during the pandemic, how like, have you sort of have you felt that, that maybe that's no, less true now, or is it just true in a different way? Um, yeah, how is, uh, is that still a, a good justification to move to the San Francisco Bay Area or has the pandemic just changed everything entirely? Um, you know, I, I just moved here. I'm making a bet that it's a good, good thing to be here and, and I've found a difference. You know, the, as the pandemic winds down, I, I had a little uh, party here uh, uh, last week with about 50 uh, folks from the Bay Area and uh, it was nice that everyone was vaccinated and we were able to, to interact. And I was just blown away by all the creativity and innovation that's still happening here. Um, and I don't think that, uh, that you know, Silicon Valley is over. Um, there, it is true that people can work remotely a lot more easily, and that's one of the changes. But there's something about just bumping into people and interacting over dinner or lunch or, or you know, in the hallway and, and asking, you know, having those serendipitous conversations um, it's not the same at in on Zoom and uh, remotely, and, and you kind of lose something. A lot of um, innovation happens in that intangible interactions. It seems I'm not a sociologist, but but that seems to be what the data say. You know, back in the 1990s, I remember reading a lot about the death of distance. You know, that the internet was going to be the end of of cities. Um, but what's happened since then is, you know, the value of real estate in San Francisco or Manhattan, you know, or these other dense places has only gone up. It seems like um, the, you know, people want to be near other humans, both for social, but also for uh, innovation purposes. Will that always be the case? I don't know, maybe Oculus or, or Venture Reality or something will, will, will change that. But for now, I, I'm still betting that uh, the people want to be interacting with other smart people. And, and there's a there are positive returns to scale, you know, as economists call it, by, by having them together next to each other. Uh, smart people create more value when they're bumping into other smart, creative people. So they tend to want to gravitate to the same place where they, where they all go. Uh, it would be a tragedy for San Francisco and maybe for the world uh, or the Bay Area if, uh, if, uh, if they didn't hang on to some of those uh, features that make it an attractive place. Um, and then people would have to find other places to gather. Okay. Thanks for that. All right, so let's have a quick look at some of our Q and A. Um, so I'm just gonna, before I read some of the more recent questions, there was an early question from the previous talk, which I think is um, uh, applicable to this one. So the question was, why are organizations still struggling with productionizing AI? Well, uh, you know, it goes back to what we, we were saying that buying the AI is just the tip of the iceberg that you really, to get full value, you need to rethink how things are, are organized. And um, let me give you two analogies. I'm not sure which one of these will work better, but um, one is, is imagine you have a, a nice Swiss watch with lots of little gears um, in there. And, and then someone says, you know, digital technology is more precise. It works better. So what if I opened up the back of the Swiss watch and I took a pair of tweezers and I went in and I carefully removed one of the gears and then I grabbed a little integrated circuit and I tried to like stick it in there and close it up again. Is that going to make the watch a little more digital, just a little bit more accurate? You know, of course not. You have to fundamentally rethink how the whole thing works to take advantage of these new technologies. It's very easy for us to see that when it's a physical set of interactions, you know, our brains are wired to understand, um, you know, the physical space. But the same thing is true for business processes. You know, what kinds of hiring systems you have, what kinds of skills the workforce does, how you interact with your customers and suppliers. Which let me try a second analogy, which which is a little closer to that. Is um, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos back in the 1990s decided that uh, he thought that these new technologies could really revolutionize the bookstore industry. He was going to make the world's best bookstore. 
imagine how lame it would have been if he'd gone into a bookstore and said, you know, this cashier could be replaced by a robot cashier. I'm going to use technology to replace the cashier with a robot. And they could have used very advanced technology for like picking the books off the shelf and scanning it. And uh, it would have been not a big change, really. It wouldn't have created a whole lot of value. And I think we can all see that, even if you spent a lot of effort on technology. The way that Amazon succeeded was by just starting over and say, wait a minute, we don't need a physical bookstore. We don't need cashiers. You know, the whole thing, we got to start over from scratch. Let's use the technology in an entirely different way. That's the kind of thing that has to happen in most cases with, with AI is that we need to, to rethink the way we do uh, you know, medical diagnosis or retailing or finance or recommendations or manufacturing. And in each case, uh, that takes a lot of creativity. It takes smart entrepreneurial people to step back and not ask, how can we do the same thing with automation, but rather what new things can we do by augmenting humans? And I'm not just not seeing that as much as we, as we, as we need to see. Mm -hmm. All right. Another question here. Uh, how likely is better AI slash ML, in quotes, um, to slow wage compensation growth for knowledge workers? Um, that's a big question. And uh, it's one I've spent a lot of time researching. Um, it's, it's, you know, a multi-trillion dollar question. Uh, just to give you some of the data, uh, uh, some of you may be familiar, but I guess it's talked about that the inequality has grown quite a bit in the United States and in, in most advanced countries. Uh, the top 1% has gotten dramatically wealthier. Well, the overall economy is creating more wealth than it ever did before. But the bottom 50%, you know, has barely budged, depending on how you mention how you measure it. There may be um, evidence that, that actually the bottom 50% is worse off than it was uh, a couple of decades ago. So this, this gap, a lot, a lot of it has to do with uh, technology, with what economists call skill bias, technical change, technology disproportionately helping knowledge workers and not helping uh, uh, less skilled workers nearly as much. But I wanna say that it doesn't have to be that way through much of history, it was the other way around. Um, if you look at the previous 200 years, it was a rising tide that lifted all boats or even compressed wages and, and less skilled workers actually um, got a bigger and bigger share of the pie. Um, and likewise, going forward, you can use technology in different ways. I mentioned automate versus augment a little minute, a minute ago. And, and if you use technology primarily to automate tasks, it tends to uh, replace blue collar and less skilled workers and drive down, turn put into competition with machines and drive down their wages. Whereas if you augment what they're doing, make them more valuable, then their wages tend to go up. Um, we just did a study with a company called uh, Cresta.ai uh, here in the Bay Area, and uh, we found a lot of evidence that technology can and is being used to, to boost wages of less skilled workers. They, they have a, 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 a tool that helps uh, call center folks and people in chat, you know, doing customer service chats. Uh, it advises them and, and, and coaches them about when to mention a new product or when to introduce pricing or, or just the tone of their voice. And what we found was that actually the less skilled workers benefited a lot more than the more skilled workers. And it actually led to a kind of a compression of wages. So that's a good example of a technology that augments humans rather than replaces them and one that compresses wages. A big question for all of us going forward is, you know, what our values are and what kind of society we want going forward. If, uh, if we want to have uh, a more equal, more broadly shared prosperity, then we should be thinking more about inventing technologies that augment uh, labor and work as opposed to uh, simply replacing it. Yeah, so essentially related to that last point and also probably a big question, but maybe one, I think one that you've definitely thought about. So the question is, uh, how about using AI to solve real world problems and not only focusing on the economy, uh, but also focusing on human well-being and sustainable use of our shared earth resources? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. well, this is one of the reasons why we need better measures of the economy. You know, one of the problems with GDP is that it doesn't measure some of those things, our health and well-being as well as it should. It doesn't measure the environment as well as it should. And I've been developing some new metrics, one called GDP-B, that measures these kinds of benefits explicitly. And if we use that as our dashboard, I think we would focus more. Our policymakers would be more incentivized to focus on that. Perhaps our managers and CEOs would as well. Technology can and, and already is being used in some ways to help those kinds of problems. Let me give you two examples. 
I'm on the, the steering committee of the board of the uh, of something called the AI index. And every year we put out a report about what's happening in AI. I encourage you to go to AIindex.org and read our latest report, which just came out a, a month or so ago, uh, a couple months ago now. And um, one of the nice things I saw was that by far the biggest growth in machine learning applications was in drug discovery and health and, and, and biological uh, applications. Um, so there's about a four and a half times increase in investment in that area between 2019 and 2020, uh, bigger than any other area. It, it was the number one area of investment. And part of that reflects, you know, as we all know, the, the, the pandemic and the demand for, for vaccines and, and understanding protein folding. But these, if you look at the data, most of these um, mm -hmm. investments, people were working on them well before that as well. And they just started scaling them up. So that's an area where, where you know, machine learning is beginning to have a big impact and hopefully all of us will live uh, longer, healthier lives as a result of those kinds of investments. On the environment, um, it's something that is critically important, you know, is to have a, our planet more sustainable. Um, I'm someone who believes that technology uh, needs to be part of the solution and, and is part of the solution. On average, digital technologies use less resources than physical counterparts. You know, whether you're driving to the movie theater or, or you know, buying a DVD, that uses more than, than just watching the, the video uh, digitally. Bits are a lot cheaper than atoms in almost all cases. Mm -hmm. And so um, as you go through and we become more of a digital economy, I think is one that can live a lot lighter on the planet. Uh, my colleague, Andrew McAfee has written a book called More From Less where he, he goes through in you know, a book length treatment the data showing that in many cases, um, digital technologies are helping with sustainability. There, you know, there's some big exceptions and there's some areas we need to work harder on, most notably in, in global warming and climate change. Uh, I think we need to take that much more aggressively, but um, done right, digital technology can be part of the solution. Again, I think um, better measurement of the benefits and costs and in the case of, of global warming, um, you know, better incentives like a carbon tax we do a lot more to steer technology in the direction of helping the environment rather than not having uh, you know polluters dump their their costs on the rest of us without bearing them themselves. Awesome. Well, thanks for that answer. I think uh, we have come to the end of our time. So with that, uh, Eric, thank you so much. This was fascinating to hear your thoughts on these subjects. And I, I think now back to Bindu. My pleasure. Great talking to you. <laughs>